Apprehensions along the United States southern border have surpassed an all-time high. In December alone, more than 300,000 people from all over the world were apprehended. And according to recent polls, more than 68% of Americans and about half of Democrats want to see tougher border enforcement. President Biden is polling low on this issue, and Republicans who smell blood are making the border a central part of their political fight and are unwilling to cooperate in any bipartisan immigration reform. To speak with me about the facts and the politics on both sides of the border, that it is truly my pleasure to welcome Andrew Silly, president of the Migration Policy Institute, and Dr. Carlos Heredia, associate professor at CIDE. Carlos, Andrew, what a pleasure to have you on Mexico Matters today, especially since the topic of today's podcast is something that is becoming the number one concern in voters' minds in the United States. This issue is actually surpassing inflation and the economy. And President Biden, whose polling numbers on border security are extremely low, has recently acknowledged that illegal immigration is a crisis. He has even said that he would shut the border if he could. Andrew, before we go into the politics of all of this, please help us understand what are the facts. I mean, there were 2.4 million encounters last year. How about the number of people that were not encountered? Why are we seeing these numbers? So I think there's three reasons. There's, there's a set of things going on, but there's at least three reasons why the numbers have gotten so big. And 2.4 is there's some repeat people in there, so it's like less than 2.4, but then there's the people who got away, right? And so fewer than 2.4 got in, but, but a lot of people got in. So there's three things going on. I mean, first is I think we have to acknowledge the U.S. labor market is really good right now. It's, it's tight. There are jobs available, 8 to 10 million jobs, depending what month you look at. And people are coming because they can get jobs, right? I mean, that's a, a huge opportunity. And other economies in the world, especially in Latin America, but also even in Europe and elsewhere, are not as good, right? So this is sort of a moment where, where there's a real advantage for people to come. Two is, is the Darien Gap is crossable. That was not true until two or three years ago, really 2021 is the first year that large numbers of people crossed the Darien Gap. It was always, you know, it was always crossing with enormous risk. And it still is a risk for people to cross it. But it is now possible. There's an infrastructure that's been built up of guides and, and water and food and that make it more doable for, for people to cross than before, right? I mean, it's still risky, but it, it, it is much more doable. And, th and that means Really, this was an issue primarily about Mexicans and Central Americans coming to the U.S. and a handful of people from other places. Now it's the world, right, has access to come to the U.S. Third is, you know, and this is where the border bill that's being discussed or is probably dying right now is comes in and sort of Biden's statements. The U.S. doesn't really have a very effective system for managing who comes in and who doesn't at the border. Right. And the reality is that 81 percent of families that got to the border in the fiscal year 2023 were allowed into the United States. And many of the others, by the way, that doesn't mean 19% were deported, that the number who were deported was, was fairly low, actually. And so there's huge incentives for people also, right? And this is a time where people know they're going to get a job in the U.S. You can, for the first time, come from much further than Central America, realistically. And your chance of being turned away at the border is low, which means there's lots of other risks along the way, the Darien Gap, organized crime. But people's biggest fear, which is to be sent back to their homes after having paid a smuggler, you know, or smugglers along the way and put money in and go back with debt is less of a concern, right? Because there is a really good chance you're going to actually get into the U.S. at the end. And, and so you add those three in. And then a few other things, I would say the Venezuelan crisis is obviously another yeah. factor that was not there where you have six, almost seven million people now living in other parts of Latin America. The moment that people cross the Darien Gap, a lot of them said, look, if I'm going to be living displaced outside my country, I'd rather be in the U.S. than Colombia or Ecuador. So there, there's other factors, but I would say those are the three big ones. 
Andrew, let me just follow up. You mentioned that for the first time, Mexican and Central American migrants have been out outnumbered by people from other parts of Latin America and elsewhere. Can you give us an idea of where are these people coming from? I mean, I have seen reports from Border Patrol saying that, you know, they have encounters from people from China, India, Bangladesh. I mean, this is far away. Yeah, I happened to be in Brownsville the week that the large numbers of Chinese citizens started arriving in, on the border, actually, because China had largely closed borders because of COVID. It's really restricted travel. So once that was lifted, about three or four weeks later, we started to see the large numbers. I, I remember being in a Border Patrol station and watching Border Patrol trying to communicate with the Chinese migrants. And it, it was a comedy of errors, actually. But, you know, one of them jokingly, one of the Border Patrol agents jokingly turned to us and said, look, I mean, seriously, but also he said, look, We know we can manage, you know, most of us speak Spanish. There's, we've learned Haitian Creole and Ukrainian and Russian, but no one here had, has learned has learned Chinese yet, right? And then we went to one of the NGOs in in Brownsville and they said the same thing. They were sort of obviously, you know, we've got materials printed in Haitian, you know, Spanish, we all speak Spanish. You know, we got materials printed in Haitian Creole, we've got them in Ukrainian. We don't have anything printed in Chinese yet, right? You know, and so people really are coming from everywhere and it changes. People come from Turkey. Large numbers of people are leaving Turkey because of the political situation. Again, not everyone's a political refugee who's leaving, but but people have lost hope. Certain people have lost hope. Others are thrilled with the outcomes but in politics, but there are people that feel that it's becoming more authoritarian. Russians are a large number of people. Central Europe, you're seeing a large number of people. Venezuelans are the biggest number at this, at this moment, with Mexicans depending on the month. But Venezuelans are a very large number. And again, they're a subset of, of those Venezuelans who are living displaced in other parts of Latin America and the Caribbean. Ecuadorians, Ecuador is in a very tough security situation, and a lot of people have left Ecuador recently. Um, Colombia, we've seen a number of people from Colombia as well. So there's, it, it really, and Haitians from South America, the number's gone down a bit. Um, very few Haitians now cross between ports of entry, but they are using the legal pathways that have been created and, and particularly Haitians in South America. Now some Haitians actually from the island are also using those systems. So it, it really is the world coming to the Mexico-US border. Right. And just the last question, just to really understand sort of what are the facts around this? You said not all of these people are political refugees, let's say, but I would assume that they're not poor people either because, I mean, it takes a lot of money to cross oceans and jungles, to pay a pollero, and despite of all of that, make your cost-benefit analysis and say it's worth it. So what are the profiles of these people? It's everything. I have been in at border points where the people coming across are clearly low income, you know, mostly from Central America and Mexico, and have clearly been through really tough journeys. I've been at at least one border crossing where, as my colleague turned to me and said, you know, they have better shoes than we do, where it was, this was a place where it was people coming from, from faraway places and were clearly middle class. There's a variety of people. And, and, and look, there are some people coming with, with, who are political refugees. There are some people coming who are running away from either government oppression or governments that are unwilling or unable to keep gangs and organized crime groups from terrorizing their families. So there definitely are people who have protection needs arriving at the border. Because one of the things that makes this really complicated, right, is sorting out who are those people that, that need international protection from those who don't. Lots of people are coming for economic opportunities. Sometimes those are mixed. And, and it depends. I mean, the other thing that's happened is you have some people who are paying $60,000 to get from China or, or India and Nepal to the U.S. Those people are probably middle class, right, or above, right? And, th and they're probably taking out loans, right? I mean, but, but they're still, they have some access to, you get people from Central America and Mexico often are hiring a smuggler from point to point, especially Guatemala and Mexico and El Salvador, which costs $10,000, $15,000, depending where you're coming from. But they're getting that money mostly from relatives living in the U.S., right? I mean, usually they're paying a quarter of it up front and they're getting the other three quarters later, right? They'll, they will then pay back gradually. So there's a system set up so that even poor migrants can migrate, right? Because they don't have that kind of money. But the relatives in the U.S. give them the first three or 4000 right, to, to be able to go. And then you have people who are doing a la carte smuggling. And there's lots of this, actually. A lot of the Venezuelans, for example, these are not the poorest Venezuelans that are coming. But they're also they're what I would call the lower middle class, right? And, and, and the impoverished middle class. I mean, a lot of them are were middle class. And then they've been living in Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and Chile. And they've become poor. But they've been able to come up with enough money that they're able to travel. But they're using smugglers a la carte. So that, you know, they're paying what you need to pay to get 
on a boat in Necoclí in Colombia. They're paying what you need to pay to get through the dairy. And on the Panamanian side, they have to pay a fee in Nicaragua. There's a fee for the government and a fee for the person that takes you to the government office. Sometimes they'll pay to get across the Guatemala-Mexico border, not always. Sometimes they'll pay parts of Mexico, Some not always. They're often following on WhatsApp or on Facebook. So they're doing a lot of this on their own, but then they pay in these. And then everyone has to pay to get into the U.S., right? Even if you're going to hand yourself in, you really do have to pay a smuggler to have the right to cross. And so, but what that's done is it's made it possible. I mean, there are some people who are clearly middle class who are coming, and you can see that Central Asians. There are some that, that really do check that box. But there's a lot of people that you would would classify as lower middle class or the top of the poor who are able to sort of pay a la carte. They're using all their savings to do this. And then you've got a few people, especially in Mexico and Central America, who are the poorest of the poor. And they're able to do this because of their relatives. Yeah. Um, Carlos, we speak and we hear a lot about, you know, this migration crisis on the side of the United States. But honestly, we don't hear anything about what is the impact of all of these migrant flows in on the Mexican side. I mean, if you had 2.4 encounters last year, I mean, all of these people went through Mexico, right? Many of them were actually returned to Mexico. Some are waiting on this side of the border. Can you please give us a picture as to what is happening in Mexico? What are the facts on this side? Well, thanks to Mexico Matters for the invite. A pleasure to uh, My share pleasure. The, the panel with uh, Andrew and Mariana, longtime friends. So three, three points. First, Mexico is the last country of transit to reach the United States for people from throughout the planet. So as Andrew correctly pointed out, you know, people coming from Africa or from Uzbekistan they are going to try to get across the Mexico-U.S. border. So Mexico is the last country of transit. It's only an ever smaller percentage of the total migrant population that actually hail from Mexico. So that's to be taken into account. The second point, although at the end of the first decade of the 21st century, you know, around 2010, people tended to believe that there was the cycle of undocumented migration from Mexico to the United States was over. It isn't over. In, in fact, it has been growing to a good extent. And correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, but I think right now, the overall volume of Mexican undocumented migrants in all these encounters, is about 23% of the total. It used to be much greater, but yes, Central American and Caribbean migration has grown very quickly, especially from Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. So regardless of policies that supposedly were aimed to dissuade migration from Mexico, that hasn't worked. So for different reasons, for economic reasons, for wage gap differential, for opportunities, Mexicans continue to migrate to the United States. And the third reason is that you don't hear much about what happens inside Mexico because all the attention of the media in the United States is on the border because the border has become a make or break issue uh, for U.S. elections much more so than in Mexico. But let's not be mistaken. There's a lot going on here. And only to go back a couple of years, the we had a huge humanitarian crisis during the program that was called Remain in Mexico, the so-called Mexican Migration Protocol, that had over 70,000, that's 7-0, 7 70,000 people wait in Mexico for a resolution of a U.S. court on whether they were allowed to enter the United States. And those people were basically abandoned. They were dumped by U.S. authorities on the Mexican border, and then they were abandoned by Mexican authorities. So many of them fell prey to organized crime, and they were forcibly recruited as hitmen or the, or the women were taken to be used for human trafficking purposes. And, um, and, and right now, there's a lot of pressure 
on border cities in Mexico, both in our southern border with Guatemala and Central America and Belize, and in our northern border with the United States. And city mayors are totally helpless, from Tijuana in the California border to Tapachula on the Guatemalan border, because they don't have the resources to cope with this enormous flow of people that want to get across Mexico to the United States. Only a small percentage actually want to stay in Mexico. And most of those is basically because they have given up. They have tried many times. They have been deported. Uh, they have been removed to Mexico. And even though they are not Mexican nationals, they would rather stay in Mexico than go back to a situation in where their lives may be in danger, like the case of Haiti or the case of Honduras that have a very elevated level of violence. I can only imagine, I mean, if we have mayors in New York or, and Chicago that are really struggling to manage the influx of migrants, I can only imagine the impact that this is having in all communities throughout Mexico. Yes, and to fine tune the picture, we are not talking only or even mainly about your traditional migrant, which is a single man that is from 15 to 45 years old. No, we're talking about families, women, children. And also we're talking about people who are not even economic migrants, but are responding to uh, violence, widespread violence, crime, gangs, and even political threats in their home countries. I was surprised the other day. I was at the Tijuana airport and I heard a lot of the airport workers were speaking Creole. So, and, you know, I asked and there are actually people from Haiti that are that are working now in Tijuana at the airport. So like, wow, I, I, I was really surprised. Andrew. Well, Andrew is a Tijuanense, so he knows the situation very well. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Carlos. He knows this issue very well. Exactly. No, but it's true. I mean, <laughs> Tijuana actually has one of the more established Haitian communities since 2015, 2016. There's a group that stayed because they couldn't get into the U.S. So there's an established community. There are restaurants. There's a barber shop. There's, you know, there are other established businesses with Haitian owners. It's become something of a draw. You're starting to see this in Mexico the way you do in the United States at a much smaller level, right? I mean, don't want to exaggerate. There's there's actually in Tapachula, there's a market right next to the cathedral. I was just in Tapachula this summer. I've been there actually the last three summers, I guess. But the market has now moved right next to the cathedral, and it's an all-Haitian market. It's all in Creole. All the signs are in Creole. The you know it is, And it is in the right in the downtown of Tapachula. Two doors down from the cathedral is a Salvadoran pupuseria, which I recommend highly, by the way. It's quite good, owned by a Salvadoran who stayed yeah. there, and all the workers are Salvadoran. You know, and so there's the beginnings in the north and the south of Mexico. You begin to see Juarez, Cubans, Tijuana, Haitians, as well as others, as well as Central Americans and others. You see a lot of Venezuelans in the Riviera Maya and the, the Caribbean coast yeah. because people who came from the tourism industry in Venezuela have moved in there. Mexico City, I mean, one of the more unusual ones, which I haven't seen with my eyes, but a friend of mine who's doing a film on the Chinampas, on this traditional agriculture in the south of Mexico City, and still rural area in the south of Mexico City, tells me that a lot of the workforce is Haitian because the children of these traditional indigenous farmers have you've gotten jobs in the city. And so the people that have come in who know agriculture are Haitians. And so you have a lot of, you have this traditional agricultural society that is still governed by an ancestral form of doing farming, but they're teaching it to the next generation who are Haitian. So this is happening, you know, it's not, it's again, it's not the same as the U.S. yet, but it's, but you're starting to see pieces of this in parts of Mexico. Yeah, it's very interesting. Andrew, let's talk now about that bill. Right. The bill that was in the Senate, regardless or, of whether or not it will pass or not pass, what's in there and what is your take on it? The main two things in the bill are creating a different asylum screening process at the border. So there is a requirement to screen people at the border or within the first 90 days and that there's a higher standard to meet for the screening. And the second is a lot of resources for the agencies that operate at the border. There's also a provision in there that when the numbers get to four or 5,000, there's discretion at 4,000, a requirement at 5,000, to stop taking asylum applications and return people to Mexico. That's something actually that would have to be negotiated with Mexico, by the way, even if it's in U.S. law. 
but you know, it is, it's in the bill if this bill were to be passed. Those, I would say, are the main aspects. There's some other pieces in there. There's actually something for Afghans to get a pathway to citizenship, for the children of certain visa holders to get a pathway to citizenship. There's some new visas. There's other things. But it really is primarily around that screening process for asylum. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, this is, this will not solve people coming to the border. It will, however, one of the draws has been, I mean, and look, the reason it doesn't solve the fact that you have a lot of displaced people in the hemisphere, it doesn't solve the fact that you have lots of jobs in the U.S. and people know they can get jobs. It does solve the other piece of this, or at least it begins to address it, which is the fact that the U.S. really has no clear system for figuring out who is a refugee and who isn't when they arrive at the border. And the default has been because they don't really have the human power, they don't have the workforce, the resources, or the systems in place, is what they're doing is, is letting most people go and then apply for asylum where when they get to where they are, right? And so that's been, most people are getting what's called a notice to appear, which is a notice to appear at some future day, usually several years down the road, at an immigration facility to state your case. But it is essentially a pass into the country. And so this is trying to limit that. It's what Trump always calls catch and release, which is not wrong. I mean, actually, you know, it is what's happening with most people. And again, as, as I say, I don't think it would solve the other two factors. You're still going to have a huge draw for people to come to the U.S. You're going to have a huge push factor for people to leave places in Latin America. But there certainly has been an added incentive for people to go because they are less worried about being sent back if they can make it to the border. And before I dig deeper into what is needed. Let me just ask Carlos one thing, especially because, as you mentioned, an important part of this agreement would accelerate the deportation, right? How many non-Mexican deported migrants could Mexico accept? Carlos, if it, it, is it, is, it is my understanding, am I right to say that no other country accepts citizens that are not their own nationals? Should should we? No, I don't think we should. I mean, we 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 could say, you know, that for for humanitarian reason, where else are they going to go? But then again, with the track record that we have of abandoning those migrants to the hands of organized crime, I don't think the Mexican government should accept again to take. I mean, to take foreigners that are not Mexican nationals because they're not going to take care of them, even though that has been promised over and over. And the United States government will once again, if he hasn't already requested that from Mexico, the Mexican government does not have neither the will nor the resources to take care of those people. Andrew, okay. Some of the measures that we're taking during the Trump administration, you mentioned the Remain in Mexico program, Uh, I don't know, separating families from their children, banning the entrance of certain nationalities completely. I mean, they were not humane and were greatly criticized, but a lot of people also say that they were actually effective. Regardless of what Democrats and Republicans want, what can the U.S. do to regain control of its border and to have an orderly, humane immigration process that would not just rely on Mexico. So Republicans tend to overshoot by being extreme in the measures to keep people out. And Democrats tend to, to underestimate how much a lack of control and a perception of loss of control of the border is political poison, right? I mean, they both sort of overshoot in different directions here. What polls tell us is the American public believes that immigration is good. There's 20% of the population, give or take, depending on the poll you look at, who doesn't like immigrants at all, right? Feels the country's changing too fast, that they're being displaced, um, mostly white, not entirely, but mostly white. And there's no question there's that deep undercurrent of fear and racism against immigrants, right? Particularly Latin American immigrants and some Asian immigrants. But most Americans are somewhere in the middle where they actually think immigration is pretty good for the country but they also are worried about the loss of control at the border, right? In the sense that there's not an orderly process in how people come in. And it's not just anymore the, it's not just people who don't understand immigration. You're starting to hear this now from people who are undocumented saying, why are these people getting essentially a piece of paper that allows them to come in the country when I've been 
undocumented for 30 years here. Why I waited for a visa for five years, or I waited for a visa for my spouse, and these people are suddenly getting two-year parole, right? So the grumbling is not just anti-immigrant. Some of it is just this sort of lack of process, right? And when it's two million people, we, we have probably about two and a half million people, two to two and a half million people that come into the legal immigration system every year. If you discount tourists and short-term stays for business, you get to about two or two and a half million people that come in for work, for family reunification, for temp seasonal work, and for education. And now it's about... 2 million people, maybe slightly less with admission that have come into the country through the border a year, the last two years. And so it suddenly starts, you know, when it was a smaller number, people grumbled, right? But now it's starting to look like a bigger part of our immigration system. So I think there's three things that need to happen. I mean, one is the one thing that this bill addresses, which is an orderly system at the border. Right now, the screening process for asylum is very limited. It, it's a low bar, and that was intentional because when very few people applied for asylum, the idea was to have sort of a wide berth. But it doesn't work well when you have hundreds of thousands of people applying for asylum in a year, right? So one is, and you have to resource the agencies. You have to make tough decisions about who gets to come in and who gets returned. I mean, that's that's one set. It's sort of the enforcement side, right? There is a need to actually reform the asylum system. This bill begins to address that. Um, the other thing that's happened now with the asylum how, system how is not... You, how do you think it, a, a perfect asylum system should look like? There, there is mean, no perfect asylum world. system. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, you have to take a lot of this out of the courts and put it in the hands of asylum officers who are more consistent and also cheaper. Courts are hard to operate. Asylum officers tend to be much more consistent in their decisions. Right, right. And it's less expensive to do and it's more agile. I do think you have to have a narrow... You know, you've had sort of a a very wide berth for people to come into the system and then a very narrow door to get through for the actual decision, which is, by the way, not great for people also. I mean, that means, you know, most people that are that are past the initial screening are not going to get asylum eventually. Those two have to be closer, right? That's actually what this bill tries to do is make that, that sort of twice, the door will be twice the size of the final door instead of 10 times the size, which is what it is right now. The idea, roughly, it's about a one in 10 chance of getting your, your case through is the, is the standard right now. This would be a one in two chance, give or take. You know, That's the shorthand, the legal shorthand not being a lawyer on this. So I think that's important. The decisions have to be made quickly. And, and by the way, that matters for people who need protection as well as for people that probably should be returned, right? I mean, that's important because right now people that in fact are running for their lives don't find out for five or six years if they're going to be sent back, you know. Then I think the other area is legal pathways. I mean, you know, we can do anything we want on trying to deter people at the border. We can certainly create a fairer and more expedited asylum system. I mean, this this bill would go part of the way down, down the path for that, at least start it. But the ultimate question is, I mean, there's a huge demand for immigrant workers in the United States, and there's a huge supply of people that are seeking opportunities elsewhere, unless we begin to address that. And that means largely visas visa policy. We're not going to... Temporary work permits, Temporary. You can be permanent. It can be temporary. You know, temporary is often good, by the way. I mean, the reality is for a lot of people, I've spent some time in rural areas in Guatemala the last few years and, and in areas where there's temporary recruitment. And it's fascinating because people like... Some people prefer coming back to their home every year. I mean, for them, it's a... What they want is earn money in the U.S. They want to stay in the U.S. For other jobs, you does have to be permanent. Like, you can't do care work temporary, right? That doesn't make sense. You know, you can't say I'll be here eight months and then I'm going to leave you and disappear. So, you know, some things do have to be permanent. Some things like agriculture are, are much easier to do temporary, some kinds of hospitality work. But figuring this out, the, the, the administration's done what's called the CHNV program for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans, which is they actually created about 300 to 360,000 legal entries with a work permit for two years for, for people from those countries. It was not a visa. It's being litigated right now. But, you know, there it was a creative way of actually opening up some legal pathways. Generally, legal pathways should be visas, but they've gotten creative around the margins on ways that they can do this because in the U.S. you can't change visa policy without Congress. And so they've they've kind of pushed the edges of what they can do. But but look, I think that's the ultimate. You know, I, I think you have to, yes, you have to be tougher at the border. You have to have better processes. You have to have a much better asylum system. But a lot of this is also having some semblance between, you know, some relationship between supply and demand. Carlos, if Washington cannot reach an, a deal on the border and on, on immigration, success or failure could actually depend on Mexico. 
Can you describe Mexico's southern border and why is it that so many Mexicans are actually able to cross into Mexico in the first place? Let me address the phrasing of your question first. Uh, <laughs> there are two reasons for the Mexican government to have many doubts about cooperation with Washington. The first one is that if President Obama cannot secure support across the aisle within the United States, it's even more difficult to begin to think about cooperation with another country, even if it's a trade partner, when there's no unified bloc saying, we have a plan that we have passed in the Congress and we're gonna work on a bipartisan way to implement it. And I know, and I know that it's uh, the MAGA Republicans who will block President it in, Biden, you mean, on, okay. on any event. And the second reason, and, and it may not be perceived in the United States, is that the recent accusation that originated, I understand, uh, in former Drug Enforcement Administration agents, that illegal money may have been funneled to the campaign of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in 2006, prompted the Mexican government to play the nationalistic card and say, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so the U.S. government who believes I was involved in taking drug money wants me as a partner? <laughs> so uh, what is the logic behind that? I I'm not, you know, saying that whatever scheme was devised is true or that he has any responsibility. In fact, ProPublica came forward, uh, the journalists came forward saying there's no accusation on President Lopez Obrador whatsoever. But in this political climate, it becomes a political football. And that's the reaction that is prompted by the very strong nationalistic current that underlies anything in the bilateral relationship. Let, let, let us remember that the screen through which the president of Mexico sees the United States and the U.S. political system is like if it were, if it were a mirror image of Mexico's political system. And that is so totally different, but that doesn't, that is not taken into account. Everything that is said in Washington is attributed to the president, to the White House, period. There was a funny moment, Carlos, last week when this was when that story came out and, uh, you know, that doesn't accuse Lopez Obrador of taking drug money, but says that there was a case that was out there and it was pursued and then was shelved eventually for lack of evidence. But, it, you know, which almost certainly was filtered by some intelligence agency, maybe, you know, I, I won't even get into speculation, but assume one of the intelligence agencies or a former agent, perhaps someone retired, filtered this out, you know, but someone with knowledge of the inside. But one of the Mexican journalists in Washington, Jose Diaz Briseño, asked the State Department spokesperson about the story. And he, he admitted that he did not know about the story. There you go. Right. The day of. Because, I saw that. Yeah, because yeah. this is not, I mean, this was not a big story in the United States. This was actually, I mean, those of us that follow Mexico, we were reading all about it. We read all three stories that came out the same day. But it did not come out in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. It wasn't on the CBS Evening News. I mean, this was not a big story in the United States at all. This was a... This was something that only people in the know yeah. knew about, but it was a huge story in Mexico, right? You know, it's so... Oh, absolutely, <laughs> huge. It still is a huge story. But Carlos, let me just return to that other part of the question. Lopez Obrador has control over Mexico's southern border. I mean, could he, if he wanted, stop the flow? And or, Joe Biden stopped the flow to the U.S. Sorry, Carlos, go ahead. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Biden cannot well, stop the flow into the let, U.S. Can let, AMLO stop the flow into Mexico? Yes and no. I'll start with the no. Okay. It's still a long stretch of border, uh, about a thousand kilometers from Tapachula on the Pacific Ocean coast to Chetumal on the Caribbean coast with Belize. Very difficult to do any kind of surveillance because it's mostly jungle, rivers. So... Pretty much anything that wants to be smuggled goes through that border, from firearms to drugs to the smuggling of persons. And the yes part has to do with the fact that if the president wants to allocate a certain number 
of National Guardsmen to watch over specific spots, not the whole 1,000 kilometers, they can do something about it. I have to say that on the Guatemalan side, there's almost no, not even physical facilities. There's no personnel. There's no staff to talk to. So you have to picture a void on the other side. Well, now, having said that, and my answer addresses the overall, the overarching question of can Mexico or can the Mexican president do something to stem the flow? Well, let me give you just one statistic that will shed some light on it. In the year 2022, the National Guard, that is a supposedly civilian but highly militarized body, only detained about 3,000 criminals in one year. Okay, this is a body of 120,000 agents. So they only detain about 3,000 criminals. In the same year, in the same 12 months, they captured 180,000 undocumented migrants, 60 times plus. But I have to say, for the benefit of our U.S. auditorium, that undocumented migrants who come into Mexico with no papers are not criminals. So it is not a crime to go across the Mexican border without papers. It's, it's still an administrative issue. So it becomes complicated when they're looked upon as criminals and say, oh, these criminals want to enter the United States. They are not criminals. So actually, the National Guardsmen have no grounds detaining them because they have not committed a crime. And they, sometimes it's difficult to understand because the legal framework in the United States is completely different. It's different, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So... Very different. Having said that, can the Mexican National Guard redirect or temporarily stop the flow of migrants? Yes, for limited territory and a limited period of time. Can they do it totally? Can they seal the border? No, they cannot. As Andrew has pointed out, this is an issue that has to be managed. It, there's no magic wand. There's no silver bullet to solve it, even less overnight. Andrew, let me ask you one question. Uh, going back to the repatriation agreements, if the United States does not have agreements with Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and thus you guys need Mexico, why give so much power to Mexico? Why couldn't just the U.S. establish your own avenues with these countries? So the U.S. does return some migrants to uh, Cuba and Nicaragua, but Venezuela, it's episodic. Okay. But it's episodic. It's not. I mean, Cuba's okay. recent. Cuba since I think May uh, last year or June. I can't quite remember, but it's not a large number. Nicaragua is every. There's a flight every couple of weeks, from what I understand. But again, it's episodic. I mean, these are all parts of larger negotiations, and those countries use this as to get other concessions that they want, right? And then Venezuela had started to take back flights of Venezuelan nationals who were deported from the U.S., but the deal that was struck between the U.S. and Venezuela, which was a broader deal around oil and gold, about taking off U.S. sanctions in return for democratic you know, gains in, in Venezuela, um, gains for the democratic process, seems to be breaking down. Yeah. And so, Ask Machado. Yeah. So, I mean, Venezuela has now indicated they probably won't take flights. Mexico is has expressed a willingness, the Mexican government, to take up to 1,000 people a day. And this was carefully calibrated, 30,000 people a month that could be sent back of those four nationals. The fourth one is Haitians, actually, who, who can be repatriated, but there was an understanding that neither Mexico nor the U.S. wants to send them to Haiti. Those four nationalities, in return for the U.S. taking 30,000 people from those four nationalities legally in each month, right, which is the CHNB program. In reality, it's never really happened. It's logistically hard 
there were a few people from those four nationalities, a few hundred, probably a few thousand a month, a few hundred a week that do get returned to Mexico, but it hasn't been large numbers. But look, that's a that's going to be a big issue. I mean, that is, it's going to be a big issue because you, you, you don't need to deport, to, to have some deterrence, you don't need to deport everyone who comes across the border, but there has to be some credible possibility. And for people from those nationalities, there's, there's not a lot of that, actually. That said, Cubans and Haitians, frankly, do not cross between ports of entry anymore. They have been very good about using the legal pathways that exist, both the ports of entry and the CHNB program. Nicaraguans, there are very few that cross between ports of entry, slightly more than Cubans and Haitians. The group that has not used the legal pathways are Venezuelans, and I suspect they're you know, they're less likely to have passports. They're less likely to have someone that can sponsor them, which is the requirement for the CHNB program. And they're just a lot of them. Venezuelans, when you've got that many millions of Venezuelans displaced living in, in other countries who have never quite, it's not, they're not necessarily badly treated in other countries. Many countries in Latin America have really gone out of their way to give legal status and access to education and health care to Venezuelans. But obviously, the conditions on the ground are not what they would hope. And you have a lot of people who are starting their lives over and don't see how they'll ever get back to where they were living in Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and other countries. And so there's a lot of them for whom the U.S. is an attractive destination. They'd rather be undocumented in the U.S., you know, because they know they can make money and send remittances back to their family members in Venezuela than stay poor, even if they're legal in, in one of the other countries. And it's a rational decision many of us would make. I'm very glad you mentioned remittances. Carlos, in all honesty, do you think that the leadership of countries like Venezuela, Cuba, others are gaming the system? I mean, don't they have a big motivation not only to export and expel the people that are obviously not happy with their own regime and even better, right? Sort of once gone, these people send billions in remittances back to their families at home. I mean, Mexicans, for example, last year sent more than $60 billion. That is more than our oil experts. And AMLO, our president, is actually claiming it as a victory. What is your take on this? It is more often the case than not that governments use migrants as a bargaining chip. So yes, they are gaming the system. And so is Mexico, and so is the United States. Migrants are used as a political football, again, depending on uh, whether it's election season or, or I'm going to negotiate something else with you. So the answer is yes. Now on remittances, it's exactly as, as you picture it. The um, inflow of remittances to Mexico is between 3 and 4% of GDP, but in the cases of countries like El Salvador, Honduras, it's about one quarter, about 25% of GDP. So it's wow. it's a vital flow to the everyday lives of millions of millions of people. It may not look as, as very big when you say three, four percent, but in, in states of the historic migration to the United States, like Michoacán, uh, Guanajuato, Jalisco, Zacatecas, that is established over a century, it, it is absolutely essential. But I'd like to add something related to the bilateral negotiation on what Mexico can do or not do and what the United States exactly wants from Mexico. I think uh, the president of Mexico, AMLO, has mastered the game. And he knows that to a good extent, the possible, maybe unlikely, but possible re-election of President Biden is to a good extent in his hands. So he knows how to play the system. And Biden sends envoys every once in a while. And what really struck me was during this last visit of uh, White House National Security Advisor, Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, the proposal that AMLO put on the table was 10 points that are totally unrelated to the Mexico-US border. I mean, they discuss you know, the Cuban embargo, and they discuss sanctions in Venezuela, <laughs> yes. and they discuss, you know, investment for development in the hemisphere and things like that. And they do not address the issue at the border, which indicates that it's going to be a long, hot summer. Well, it tells you something underlying about the relationship, which is, you know, immigration at the border has become, and not immigration generally, but the border has become a hot topic in the U.S. It's a really political topic. It's one of the top topics in the country. It is not in Mexico. 
you know, it matters to people in the northern and southern border. There is a bit of a pushback because of the large numbers of people coming through and the caravans were very visible. But it's not. But it's certainly not part of the campaigns. No, it's not part of the campaigns. It's not part, you know, and to the extent that migration is part of the campaigns, the bigger issue is actually about reaching out to Mexicans abroad, not always genuinely, perhaps, but but it certainly comes up as, you know, compatriotas and, you know, we have to take care of the Mexicans abroad. But it's not, it's less about the borders of Mexico. And so there's a real, there are always lots of asymmetries in this relationship. And, you know, historically, you know, the asymmetry tends to favor the U.S. as a bigger economy and a global power and all that. But the asymmetry favors Mexico in other ways, right? I mean, this is, you know, as, as Carlos says, Lopez Obrador has has figured has, out that this has is mastered the game. Yeah. Yeah. Life and death for Biden. Yeah. And it's a give for him because it's not a big political issue. And he's not the first Mexican president to to discover that, but he may be the most habil or the most sort of skillful at, at managing this in the I relationship. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. and that's but there are lots of asymmetries in, in this relationship and they cut both ways. A lot of them do cut in favor of the US, of course, but not all of them do. Unfortunately, I think we could keep having this conversation and we haven't touched upon drugs and drug cartels, but we have come to the end of this podcast. So I will invite you both next time to continue this conversation. Thank you so, so much. And I fully agree with you. I mean, whomever wins in the next presidential election in both countries, the truth is that we're going to have to cooperate in order to allow this issue to improve, if only a little bit. Thank you so much, Carlos, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mariana. And Carlos, good friend. Good to see you. My pleasure. Take care. If you enjoy this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog.